Did you know archaeological excavations across Scandinavia have found dozens of thousands of dirham coins from the Islamic world? How did this happen? Well, mainly trade between the Vikings and Muslim powers such as the Abbasid Khalifat during the medieval period. Let's find out more! I'm sure many people know that the Vikings were originally from Scandinavia, from the countries of Denmark, Norway and Sweden. But did you know that we can trace which group of Vikings moved in which direction? For the most part, the Danish and Norwegian Vikings raided westward, in the direction of the British Isles and France. An example of this was the group of Vikings we covered in our video that attacked Al-Andalus in the mid 9th century. But the Vikings from Sweden actually moved southeast, in the direction of what is now known as Ukraine and Russia. Some went as far as the Byzantine Empire and offered their services as mercenaries, forming what would become known as the Varingian Guard, which eventually served as the personal bodyguards of the Byzantine Emperor and even became the elite unit of the Byzantine army from the 10th until the 14th centuries. Some of these Swedish Vikings even set up a powerful state known as the Kievan Rus. Interestingly enough, the name Russia comes from the term Rus, which was an old term used to describe people whose ancestors were from Scandinavia. This shouldn't lead us to get overexcited and assume all modern day Russians are Viking descendants, because by the 13th century, the Scandinavians had become assimilated with the Slavs inhabiting the area. Now that we have the contextual knowledge of the Vikings, let's delve into their relations with the Muslims. The first thing to mention about Vikings trading with the Muslim powers such as the Abbasids was that it was almost always done through intermediaries or middlemen. The most likely of these intermediaries would have been the Khazar Haganat or the Volga Bulgars, both of which were strategically placed to take advantage of the Volga River trade route. Now, considering dirhams from the Islamic world are by far the most excavated form of coinage in Viking held areas, there must have been a lot of trade happening between the two parties. So what did either side get out of it? Well, for the Vikings, the Muslims coined dirhams in silver. This would have been super attractive to the Vikings. Because, aside from being pretty durable and long lasting, silver is also very convenient for how easily it can be transported, which would have obviously complemented the Viking way of life with its emphasis on raiding and settling in different places. At the time, some Viking settlements did not have their own currency and may well have used dirhams instead. This might be why silver dirham coins found throughout Scandinavia were cut in half or even in quarters. The Muslims also sometimes paid in silk as well, which the Vikings may have viewed as a symbol of prestige as we know they sometimes used it in their burials. What about the Muslims? What did they get out of trading with the Rus? Well, the Vikings provided a variety of products including a range of furs and honey. But perhaps the most important item of trade between the Vikings and the Muslims would have been slaves. The Vikings were prolific slave traders, who in their campaigns of plunder would also enslave with the aim of selling their slaves on. One group of people that often fell victim to Viking enslavement were the Slavic people. The 10th century Persian geographer Ibn Rusta mentioned that the Rus living along the Volga river sail their ships to ravage the Sakhaliba and bring back captives who they sell at Khazaran and Bolgar. Some people actually think that the term slave comes from the ethnic Slavs. I don't think this is unanimously agreed upon, but still the fact that there is an association between the two terms indicates some sort of a connection between them. In any case, we know that various Islamic empires imported slaves they termed as Saqaliba an Arabic term most often associated with Slav, but sometimes also referred to other European peoples as well. In Al-Andalus, one of the many Taif estates that emerged in the aftermath of the disintegration of the Caliphate of Cordoba at the beginning of the 11th century was the Taifa of Denia, which was founded by a former slave of Slavic origins, Mujahid al-Amiri. In the Fatimid Caliphate, the famed general, Johar, was apparently of Slavic origins, although this is countered with claims of him being Sicilian as well. In the Umayyad Khalifat, the first Khalif, Mawiyah, supposedly settled as much as 5,000 Slavic mercenaries in Syria according to the Byzantine chronicler Theophanes. Again, the slave trade would rarely have happened directly between the Vikings and the Muslims, 
Rather, it would be carried out between the intermediaries, for instance, the Khazars or the Volga Bulgars or even the Byzantines. One thing I should mention is that when I use the word Muslim, I'm speaking about something very specific, because I know the Volga Bulgars became Muslim somewhere around the 10th century, or at least its leaders did, but when I say Muslim, I'm referring to the Abbasid Khalifat and other powers that were closer to the traditional heartland of the Islamic world, places like Afghanistan and Iran and the Middle East. Back to slaves. Now it's important to remember that slaves held a tremendously important role within the wider framework of running an empire. In the first place, they were a commodity that you could benefit from. As bad as that sounds morally, slaves could be counted on to do menial and manual labour. But a far more interesting usage for slaves was reserved in places closer to centres of policy making. You see, Muslim rulers often preferred to import slaves that would go on to constitute an integral element of the administration or military of a state. This was done because if you introduce a foreign group of people that have no associations with the indigenous people of your realm, those foreign slaves can't get tied up in political intrigues or factional rivalries since they are wholly dependent upon you, the Sultan or Khalif. This was seen in the Abbasid Khalifat with the importation of Turkic soldiers from Central Asia and the Caucasus region, as well as in the Fatimid Khalifat with black soldiers or eunuchs imported often from Nubia. In addition to this trade-related information about the Vikings' interactions with the Muslims, we're also fortunate enough to have a few different Muslim accounts of the Rus that still exist today. The most famous of which are the 10th century accounts of Ibn Fadlan and Ibn Rusta. Ibn Fadlan was sent by the Abbasid Khalif in 921 as part of an embassy to the recently converted Volga Bulgar Khan. On his journey, he witnessed the way of life of Vikings that had settled near the Volga River. It's actually from Ibn Fadlan's account that we get an eyewitness description of the infamous Viking ship burial. You can find out more about this primary source from the detailed video Voices of the Past Did, which I'll link in the bio. Whilst Ibn Fadlan was very complimentary of the Rus' physical attributes, calling them perfect physical specimens, he was not so flattering about their hygiene. Apparently, they would wash their face and hands from the water of a basin that they would all spit in as they were using it. Strangely enough, Ibn Rusta was actually much more complimentary of the Rus' hygiene, commending them for carrying clean clothes and the use of fashionable accessories such as bracelets. Again, Voices of the Past did a video on that primary source as well, which I'll link in the bio. One particularly interesting segment from Ibn Rusta's account describes how when a Rus son is born, the father will approach the baby with his sword in hand, he then throws the weapon on the ground and says, I will not leave you with any property, you have only what you can get with this sword. Which kind of puts it into perspective why there was such a thing as the Viking Age. I mean, how do you compete with that kind of mentality? Thank you guys for watching. This video is a part of Vikings Month, a collaboration between different history YouTubers that focuses on the epic history of the Vikings. I'll leave a link to the playlist in the bio for you to watch the other videos on the Vikings as well. Also, make sure to like, comment and subscribe. 2020, you'll see me uploading videos on a lot of fascinating topics. And check out my Patreon page if you want to contribute to Hikma history. Until next time, peace.